four generations of one family. Their lives and causes reveal 150 years of American history. In my 67th year, having been the object of much misrepresentation, for my children, I commit these memoirs to writing. And to them and their posterity, I recommend those moral sentiments and sacred thoughts which at all hazards and by every sacrifice I have endeavored to preserve through life. Oh boy. 1758, young John Adams, born in the colony of Massachusetts, Harvard graduate, sometimes schoolmaster, would-be lawyer, a faithful subject of the British crown. His soon-to-be sovereign, George of Hanover, Prince of Wales, heir to the throne of England, an earnest, not too bright young man, anxious to succeed at the job he was born to, that of being a king. Sovereign and subject, separated by 3,000 miles of ocean and chasms of birth, breeding, wealth, and privilege. Neither knows that they are embarking on a collision course. We'll see you briefly. Mr. Adams. Mr. Gridley. On my desk. You do not know me, sir. However, you are acquainted with Mr. Putnam, with whom I've been studying law in the country. What do you want of me? Sir, I need a patron who will recommend me to the bar in Boston. Why well, come to me? You admit I don't know you. Well, I scarcely know Putnam. I have no lawyer friends here who can testify to my learning. They told me you would not be influenced by a man's connections, but by his qualities. How long did you say you'd studied the law? I've been Mr. Putnam's clerk for three years. You read Latin? Indeed. The last Latin I read was Justinian's Institutes. Where did you find that work? I have no copy in these colonies but my own. I borrowed a copy from the Harvard College Library. I was a student there. Studying what? Theology. And why did you abandon that worthy pursuit? Well, I had developed certain doubts. About God? No, sir. About my fitness for the pulpit. So then you settled on the law? No, sir. I taught school for a while. Yes? I found I lacked the patience to instruct the young. And what makes you think you are now fit for the law? To practice law in these colonies. A man is the oratory of a preacher and the patience of a country schoolmaster. Law here is not like law in England. Here you must be a man of all work. You must know your common law, your civil law, your admiralty law. Do the duty of solicitor, 
counselor, attorney, scrivener. Here, take these. For all that, there are 300 hungry lawyers right here in Boston. Well, sir, I, I hope to practice law in the village where I live. Good lawyers are needed there. In Braintree, every spring, men's passions thaw out and heat up after a cold, hard winter. I've seen such greed, such vanity, such anger that only murder could come of it. Yet those untamed beasts, roaring and blustering, are brought under control in the courthouse by the law. Hmm. You read your Puffendorf? Puffendorf? No, I, I can't Terrible say... lack in you. Of course, you've studied Cook's Institutes. Indeed, I have just finished reading an abridgment. An abridgment of Cook. You read the father of our English common law in little snippets. Well, sir, it is difficult to obtain Cook's complete works here in Massachusetts. They can be imported from London. You don't squander your resources in women and drink. Mr. Gridley, I believe I have lived a moral and temperate life. At Harvard, that citadel of riot and dissipation. Sir, I have resolved to marry without a stain upon my name or my conscience. Does that satisfy you? No, sir, it does not. Not if you mean to marry at all. Nothing ruins a young lawyer's prospects so much as an early marriage. Distractions, children, the end of study, the constant pursuit of riches. A young man should follow the law as a great end in itself, not for gain. That is impossible with a wife, unless you happen to come of a wealthy family. No, sir, my father is a farmer. I, I will inherit his house and some land, but nothing more. Indeed, I know how difficult it shall be. I'm prepared to work the farm to keep myself alive, but I mean to be a lawyer. Sir, you've detained me far too long, Mr. Adams. I'm due in court now. Mr. Gridley, I have ridden half this day to meet you, hoping that you would test my knowledge of the law and my skill at languages. Mr. Gridley! Mr. Gridley, you cannot leave without testing me. Mr. Adams. I'm certain you own a few weary Latin quotations and a dog-eared Greek grammar. As for your possession of legal knowledge, I have no doubt you read too much, too quickly, and understood none of it. No, sir, I cannot recommend you to the bar for your learning. Abridgments of Cook, indeed. However, if you appear in court early tomorrow, I will present you to be sworn at the bar. But why? I admire the way you handled my books. You held them gently with the respect due the record of our laws. Any man can be passionate about knowledge. Only a rare few can be tender towards it. Indeed, I have high hopes for you. Once you have read your Puffendorf, you, my friend. Sam Adams! <laughs> what brings you to Brain Street? I came as soon as I received your message in Boston. I didn't write for you. Exactly. That's the message I received. <laughs> Why have I not heard from Cousin John in months? Have you been ill? I'm never ill here in Brain Street. And why this silence? Perhaps your fingers are too sore from your legal labors to write. But your ass looks strong enough for a trip to Boston. Don't dissemble with me, Sam. You know very well why I can never go to Boston again. You think me so brazen to parade my failures there? What failures? Well, surely it's all over Boston. Field versus Lambert? No. My Uncle Field gave me my first case here. He brought his neighbor Lambert to law to prevent Lambert's cow from grazing on his property. I drew up a writ so hastily, I failed to put in the name of the county. And the case was thrown out by the court. John, one case means nothing. But it was more than one case, Sam. The very next month, I defended a client accused of selling an old horse under false pretenses. Well, I did not fully understand.